and we are live and on for uplink number 23 mr mccorkman how are you doing i'm just a doctor indeed welcome back <laughs> nice to see you again good to see you alex yes uh it's been a few weeks but uh you know holiday season and all that and plans coming and going but <clears throat> yeah it's always good always good always look forward to uplink and uh we got some uh some really interesting stuff ahead of us this evening yes uh, yeah, no question you know i i suppose um you know it's not that i'm the nostalgic type well it's not true at all i i kind of am <laughs> but uh you know we're we're up to 23 episodes now and uh we've covered a lot of topics you know and you'd think that we'd be repeating by now and while there are some themes that do return in different sorts of ways depending on the voices uh i, I suppose you could say tonight's topic is uh unique because it, it it not only you know breaks completely new ground in many ways but um it's almost as if the week's events were planned so that we would have a lot to talk about on this episode um, so I, I thought before we get to it you'd be the man to uh introduce us to who's joining us tonight yeah well you know it's the topic which <clears throat> almost by definition, we don't talk about it ESA, um, because if I was to read, and I have it right in front of me here, the ESA convention, uh, the purpose of uh, the European Space Agency shall be to provide for and to promote for exclusively peaceful purposes, cooperation among European states in space research and technology and their space applications exclusively peaceful purposes that appears in the convention in many places so the ESA has nothing at all to do with the military aspect of space but it's there and it's been there right since the beginning and I you know in talking with you about this we thought well there's a lot going on there and as you said with the launch today maybe there's another aspect to discuss um let's let's bring in some experts on that and we have two people who are from from different perspectives are very um well qualified to talk about that so we have blevin bowen who is a lecturer at university of leicester in the uk he's an he's an expert in exactly this area in the strategy uh and the purpose of space from a military perspective so space warfare if you like um and and he works in this area and he has a lot to say about the fact you know people often forget that space has been militarized forever you know are, are we now looking at the future militarization and you say you know <laughs> it's been since day one more or less um and complementary to that is jonathan mcdowell who like me uh by training is an astrophysicist but jonathan works at the center for astrophysics uh, at harvard in the usa uh, he's a Brit. Uh, you'll you'll hear the kind of dodgy mid-Atlantic accent, same same kind that you have, but coming from the oh, other you. direction. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, but he has spent years, in parallel to his work on the Chandra X-ray Observatory and previous X-ray missions as an astronomer, he's been cataloging all objects in low Earth orbit, uh, all launches and all bits that come out of launches and then tracking them. So he has an awful lot of background, an awful lot to say about what is in low Earth orbit and what it's used for. Um, and, you know, these are things outside of the war domain as well. So we, we'll talk this evening, I think, about mega constellations and about the, the launching of thousands of new satellites into low Earth orbit to provide internet connectivity to the ground and what the ramifications for that are. Uh, in terms of the peaceful uses of space or the civilian uses, let's say, you know, this is commercial usage. How do we see that in contrast uh, or to, in complement um, to what we're doing in the civilian space agencies like ESA, NASA and so on? So I think there's an awful lot of interface there between those two sides. And I'm you know, really looking forward to talking to Blethyn and uh, Jonathan about that. Indeed, uh, as am I. So I, I suppose without further ado, we shall uh, we shall bring them into the fold and uh... Yeah, get them online. Very good. Jonathan, are you receiving? Yes, I am. Hi, Alexander. <clears throat> Fantastic. A uh, delight to have you on. And uh, uh, we're just uh, bringing Levin in, in just one moment as well. Um, uh, you know, Jonathan, I, I suppose uh, I should probably start with uh, uh, a little news update. Um, you know, I wondered if you wanted to lead on that. You know, I could see you were tweeting um, a little earlier in the evening, um, you know, on our time. Has anything notable happened in the last, I don't know, day or two that that you think should probably come up on the thing? Or is it just sort of a... <laughs> what, what, just you. another day in space, Alexander. No, it, it, it's... <laughs> um, uh, so the most notable thing, I think, is the launch this morning of the uh, Chinese space plane. Uh, and uh, it's been um, 
oh dear, now I'm going to have to try and pronounce what they uh, uh, what they called it, but it's the uh, reusable test spacecraft they're calling it, and it went up from their Jiaquan spaceport in the uh, in Inner Mongolia uh, into a 300 kilometer orbit, uh, and it's very it's very hush hush. It's a bit odd because they didn't announce the launch time, which they normally do. They were very quiet about it. In, in the upshot, they haven't shown any pictures of the launch. And so that leads one to think this is not only a, a space plane, it's a military space plane. Uh, maybe something that's the Chinese equivalent of the X-37. And so okay. as of now, we, we don't really know what it fully is. As you say, this is supposition that it's a plane. I mean, it reusable yeah. means that it will come back down but, to the ground and land again. Um, it, it could be like Dragon. It could be a, it, it could be a reusable capsule. Absolutely. Um, it could even be uh, a test of their, they, they earlier uh, in the year, they tested a new generation capsule uh, that's sort of a bit like their Dragon. I guess, uh, and uh, that's been using a different launch vehicle. So I'm, I'm guessing this is something different and just the, the lack of publicity around it does make one think in terms of, of a military vehicle of some kind, but you're right. It may not be, um, uh, it may not be a plane. That's just rumors at this stage. Right. And, and just before we bring Blevin in, I mean, just the, the sort of thing for me, I just, in the spur of the moment, this was launched on, is it Long March 2F rather than, uh, and I don't know, is that a man-rated launcher or a crew-rated crew launcher? That is rated launcher, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that the, the 2F has been used in the past for uh, the Shenzhou uh, human spaceship and also for the Tiangong Space Labs, which used a slightly different version called the 2F. T and it that appears to be what they've used this time. So uh, so but we, we we have no in, in principle could be humans on board, but there's no sense that there are at this time, right? Yeah, I th I don't think so. I think I, I think that that they would have said so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wrong, but, but yeah, but it could well be it it could be something that is human rated, absolutely, or it could just be an X-37 type thing. And we don't, that, that's, you know, so many questions, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, so, so we'll come back. I think we'll come back to X-37 and what that's been doing over the last number of years, because that's a fascinating topic many people don't know about. So I think we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, so Blethin, you, you made it. You know, some, some technical problems there, I guess, but. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what that was, but no, um, you no know. Problem. Anyway, yes, no, we, we just, so we just uh, welcome you in. Um, we were talking to Jonathan about, of course, about the, launch of the Chinese reusable whatever it might be whether it has wings or not who knows we'll, we'll see um, has anybody actually tracked it yet I wonder I mean given that the track is known has anybody seen it in twilight somewhere pass overhead I haven't seen any reports uh, we've just we've got the TLEs the US tracking data so so the US government has been tracking it a new TLE just came out uh, which shows that it hasn't maneuvered since launch okay uh, <clears throat> so that's interesting. It's not like going all over the place or look, making rendezvous burns, at least at this stage. Right. So Blevin, let, let's let's bring you in on this because you know the assumption sort of is that because it there's not been really much said about it by China in advance. There were there were thoughts that it was going to happen. Um, it, I'm not even sure we know the exact launch time. We would probably do now. We can trace the orbit back, but. Um, it, it raises this issue, which I know you're you're hot on on social media. You know, oh, is China going to start militarizing space? Is it going to change the dynamic? You know, we're seeing a whole new Cold War. So this is sort of an entry point for you to talk about, you know, your view on this, right? This sort of mistake that space isn't militarized uh, and that it's just about to happen. So. Well, 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 yeah, I mean, asking whether a country like China is militarizing space is, is getting reality wrong, really. It's, it's a wrong question to ask because space has always been militarized and China's had a, um, a military orientated space program for a very long time, for decades, uh, back uh, you know, to the 1950s, you know, the earliest years of the communist state. So uh, that's nothing new. But the same is true also for the Soviets and the Americans and many other states as well. There have always been, um, you know, military origins to space programs and primary drivers to space programs as well, rather than the more scientific um, perception that most people have about uh, space technology and the uses of space today. So, um, so the question, the important question really isn't what um, 
uh, you know, whether China is militarizing space, space is already weaponized, uh, sorry, militarized. So um, it really is, is the question of um, what exactly is China developing and, and fielding and testing and what role will those, will those technologies play uh, in the larger um, technological development of various uh, military and intelligence centers um, that China is developing for the modernization of its terrestrial military forces in the same way that um, the United States has been doing. Um, so the X-37 that you mentioned is, um, as the only thing we really know about it in detail is that it's a sensor test bed. It's there to test very um, exotic new kinds of sensors, very cutting edge stuff. Uh, and then it can bring them back for further um, experimentation analysis and assessment of what, how they've behaved in orbit and then maybe send the same things back up again very cheaply and quickly. So so imagine if it's a space plane and it's the same sort of thing as an X-37, then it's reasonable uh, that the Chinese might be looking to do the same to um, develop new sensors of their own, uh, which could have a whole range of, of uh, utility as well. So these sensors have a range of dual use um, uh, potentials, you know, military, uh, civilian, economic, infrastructural. So that it's quite ubiquitous, really. So, um, uh, so yeah, we don't know much about the details. And um, China is very secretive in general about most of its launches. Uh, we usually have to wait for confirmation from the Chinese government itself as to what it's actually put up and then for it to be verified uh, or, or its flight path to be verified by various international observers and sensor data as well so we'll find out in the next yeah. few days hopefully hopefully we'll get more detail I, I, if I'm not mistaken I think I saw that the Chinese have confirmed that they have put a space plane of some description up uh, but beyond that, yeah, there's little official confirmation. I imagine America might make some statement at some point in the mm. coming days or weeks about it. Yeah. And I think the, this question of militarization, right, is is uh, uh, this this will if this is a military reusable spacecraft, that's got, indeed got to make people in the US go, ooh, 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 China is making space more military. Uh, and as usually, it's something that the Chinese are responding to something that the US did like five years ago. Uh, that the US thought was perfectly fine to do it. Yeah. I mean, I, I would, I would, I'd be careful in terms of saying it's purely sort of responsive. I mean, these are useful technologies, regardless of what the Americans are doing, really. Uh, in the same same way that, you know, the Russians too, uh, you know, developed loads of military space-based sensors for their own military needs, regardless of exactly what the Americans are doing. Um, so there's always a, a, a large mix of uh, incentives and interests in developing that, any kind fair. of system. <clears throat> I guess I really meant it, it's not new. It's not yeah. something... Oh, no, no, it, it's it, not it, unprecedented. It's, it's not a... Um, uh, an uptick in militarization is just, uh, uh, but but and you swallowed a word, but in that that is critical in this juncture I think, which is weaponization, that almost came out of your mouth, and, <laughs> and uh, uh, which is you know controversial how to define it, but I think that's the thing that people don't understand when people talk about military space, is that yes, space has been militarized since the 1950s, but for the most part, with a few exceptions that hasn't involved weapons and, you know, Star Wars fighter planes in space and things like that. And that's really the concern that a lot of people have right now is that we do seem to be moving in a more aggressive direction rather than using military space as support elements for uh, military forces on the ground. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd take issue with weaponization as well. I mean, that's, that for me is a bit of a red herring in terms of understanding the reality of military activities in space because people are afraid or worried about placing weapons in space that can shoot other satellites. Um, and, um, you know, those are fine, but in, in isolation, uh, thinking about them in isolation, uh, does a disservice to the reality that the major space powers have been able to make a mess of Earth orbit without putting weapons in space for decades. And the notion that space has been a sanctuary until now or the next few years, that is also a, a bit of a myth as well. Uh, the Soviets and the Americans have a long history of Earth-based anti-satellite weapons development. The, the Soviets and the Russians have a lot of heritage in space-based weapons testing as well. Um, and um, so if there's a shooting war tomorrow between any major powers, um, they can really make a mess in Earth orbit if they really 
really want to already mm. really so for me if you put weapons in space as a basing method it doesn't change that reality if we have a proper shooting war tomorrow and if we do there's a good chance it'll go nuclear and then we won't be worried about machines in space <laughs> getting blown to shreds we'll have far bigger problems than that's, this. that's a fair point well, i do take a little issue with what you said yeah. into that uh, mark you yeah, so no let me i just wanted i think you know we go back to the origins of, of the military in space in, in a moment but i just wanted to pick up on this one point that came up today and this is something which has surfaced more than once is that the initial TLE, tle's um the trajectory of uh, this this craft may have taken it close to the x-37 uh and, and there was also then a sense later on it might go near one of the uh national reconnaissance office's latest uh, launches as well now again this is all very preliminary and i don't know but this isn't this wouldn't be unprecedented there have been maneuvers of spacecraft towards classified payloads before is that from your perspective is that actually I mean, and we don't know, so it's speculation. Is that really to go and sort of take high-res pictures of the other object from close by? Or is it the equivalent of, you know, in the Cold War of the Russian bear spacecraft coming in and testing airspace over the North Sea and basically sort of acting provocatively, but not intending to do anything more than sort of, you know, test and respond? This is talked about a lot. I don't know how real it is, but from your understanding of the orbits of these things, Jonathan, what would you say these things are intended to do? I, yeah, I, I would say for this particular reusable Chinese spacecraft, the story that it was going close to the X-37 turned out to be wrong. That was okay. a wrong guess about the inclination. Um, it is in a somewhat similar orbit to a, 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 an even more secretive NRO satellite called USA-276, but it's not that close. The uh, orbital planes are different. Uh, and, and so it doesn't seem to be creeping up on something. But there was a Russian satellite that synchronized its orbit with a, a US National Reconnaissance Office satellite earlier this year. Uh, and made repeated passes to, you know, not like up to a kilometer and sniffing, which would be very pro provocative, right? But, but a few hundreds of kilometers away, which is far enough perhaps not to be entirely provocative, but still you kind of look over your shoulder and go, huh, he's really watching what I'm doing. Uh, yeah. and, and so that is sort of a new thing. People have done it with their own satellites before, but not with other people's satellites to the same extent in low orbit. So, so, so that's an interesting thing that we're watching. Right. I mean, both the Russians and the Americans have um, sort of orbital inspection technology. So the U.S. Air Force, which I, I don't know if it's being transferred to the Space Force or not, but um, they've had the GSAP. Um, I forget what the acronym entirely stands for, but it's GSSAP, I think. Um, that does orbital inspections uh, of various kinds and space situational awareness duties in geosynchronous orbit. Um, but as far as I it's not been behaving as perhaps uh, bullishly as uh, the Russian um, Olymp. Uh, satellite, if I remember that, that name correctly. Um, and as far as the purpose, I mean, it could be both. I mean, um, again, I don't know the technical specifics, but um, getting good images of the actual physical hardware, you know, visual images of a classified satellite um, that'll get you a good look at what's being sent into space, at least from the outside, that you can't get because you can't inspect the payloads the Americans are sending up on the ground. So getting a camera close enough with high enough resolution, uh, that's a way to do it. But, it. but it's also a political statement as well, saying it's, it, it is a way for Russia to say, you know, we can keep up with the Americans or we can do things they don't like. Um, and also perhaps to say, you know, it's not just China that's giving the Americans a run for their money in space in terms of fancy, exotic and, you know, making making movies movements that um, uh, excites a lot of the hawks in the American uh, foreign and defense policy establishment. Right. So obviously uh, we can't really predict how history will be told a hundred years from now. You know, I mean, may we be so lucky to, you know, have history being told a hundred years from now, but one way it might be summarized is China has entered the chat clearly, you know, this development signifies something politically um, that, you know, whatever it may mean, you know, from a military standpoint or whatever else, uh, if you follow space Twitter, everyone just went, well, that's interesting because it's obviously sparked perhaps a, a, a dialogue, a conversation um, about a subject that's always really been there, um, but is surprising to some, which is that uh, there does seem to be a, a race of sorts, um, which is on it perhaps may have been going on for some time. So I, I just wondered if we could pull back from the specific thing, what do you think it signifies? And where would you predict we may be going with all this, uh, possibly with an allusion to Mark's own background, <laughs> you know, um, which is obviously how some people, you know, envision some things. What are the problems inherent? Is there a way to slow it down? 
um, is there an arms race that could be happening underneath our noses? Because as an observer, uh, the way this is being reported on, um, it's interesting to put it mildly. Um, I mean, those are lots of big questions um, <laughs> all at the same time. Uh, they're, they're all good questions. And I think I start by saying um, um, a lot of this is new to a lot of people because unlike those of us who work in space or, or um, are interested in space, most people aren't. They don't care about space. They, they, might, you know, they might know about the moon landings and, and maybe that's about it and the space station um, and maybe a couple of robotic probes. That's what they think space is. Most people just aren't interested in space. Um, so so I think um, for, for a lot of people, most things about space are entirely new um, in, in most parts of the world. Um, as for um, China, I mean, China's been often ignored. It's Chinese space history has been ignored by a lot of the sort of US space policy community for, for a long time. And that's not to uniquely criticize the Americans. I mean, at least it has a space policy community to speak of. Um, but, um, but even then, sort of Chinese space history isn't that well known either. Um, and the Americans um, uh, sort of, they, they cooperated a lot with the Chinese in the 1970s and the 1980s following the Sino-Soviet split um, and then the opening up of uh, China's economy to the world then by, you know, after Mao's death. Um, so following Nixon, space was uh, normalized as part of bilateral relations and America accelerated a lot of um, the more high technology aspects of Chinese satellite development. They'd already had the, you know, the basic satellite technologies and missile technologies for their nuclear program already sorted. But a lot of the higher end um, satellite modernization and applications um, was assisted by the Americans. Uh, the Chinese got uh, built two Landsat terminals um, by the 1980s, if I remember correctly. Uh, so there's some really good academic research on this um, uh, recently. So, um, so so that, that history isn't very well known, even within sort of a lot of the space expert community, especially the more academic side, which I'm familiar with on the policy side. Um, so as, as the way things are going, um, space, space race or space arms race, those are two more of my uh, hated buzzwords along with militarization. <laughs> I, 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 knew, I knew he would provoke you when he said yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it oversimplifies what's going on, really. I mean, um, every major economy has an interest in modernizing its military forces uh, and space is just another plank on which that is done. Uh, it's fairly routine, it's mundane, space is about infrastructure, it's very useful and countries can make money out of it and stimulate their high technology industries and the military industrial complex is a part of that uh, you know in, in various shapes and forms depending on where you know which country or continent you're looking at. So, so this is an outgrowth of China's return if you will as um, a major power in the international system uh, you know, following, you know, the end of the um, Second World War and the Chinese Civil War. So, um, so I don't see it as exceptional in that regard. You'd expect this sort of behaviour from a large power uh, in any sense of the word in the 21st century. Um, and space weapons, I mean, they're not something that's come overnight. These are, these are weapon systems and technologies that have a long incremental piecemeal historical development really and now we're seeing their maturation but also the increasing dependency of various countries on satellites for uh, mil you know, conventional military power so there's even more of an incentive to take them out um, so um, and all that's still happening when the major powers are still pointing nuclear weapons at each other as well so um, so where we're going to be in 100 years I don't know it depends on the nukes. <laughs> and I think that one, one thing that that people also aren't aware of is how China was really not a player in space for a long time. Uh, they, they were slow to the table uh, compared to say France or Japan. And they made a decision in maybe the late eighties to change that and to really invest hard. And they kind of went from first gear to fourth gear <laughs> overnight. And they've been, uh, they ramped up their capability to the point where now they are having more orbital launches or as many orbital launches as the US and possibly more. And, and so what we've seen is them repeating the firsts that the US and the Soviet Union did in the 60s and catching up. And now they're at a point where, yeah, their tech is maybe not quite on the level of the US, but more or less, they can do the same things as, uh, as the US. And they're they're now starting to look for areas that they can take the lead, and I, and I think that that so China as 
the big space player next to the U.S. is a new thing, uh, and uh, and and is mirrored by a drop off in Russian launch rates and Russian uh, uh, capabilities, and and so I think that's a change. But but I totally agree with with what what Ben said that 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 uh, the um, you know it's what you expect a big power to do. Uh, in terms of the space <laughs> weapons. Um, I will say that yes, there have been. You know, the the first space weapons was probably the uh, um, uh, the uh, Nike Zeus anti satellite weapon in, in 1962 from the U.S. and the Polyot uh, uh, prototype space uh, uh, orbital interceptor in 1963. They've been around for a long time, but the systems haven't been very much deployed. And at least for the last 20 years, there haven't been operational ASAT systems around. And now we're seeing, I guess, a switch back to a rhetoric, or maybe it's just rhetoric, of expecting war in space rather than, you know, sort of being vaguely prepared for it. Uh, uh, and with that, we're seeing a new system being tested by the Russians, and uh, we've seen a um, suborbital system being tested by the Chinese, and a lot of discussion on the U.S. side. So, so I think that um, you know, it's maybe nothing really new, but there's a sort of shift in rhetoric that bears watching. Yeah, and, and I mean, everything is happening always in a larger context. And sometimes in the commentary on this, it's, it tends to focus in on a specific event or a specific deployment or mission that is, doesn't have that longer context. And to understand China's rise as a space power, you do have to understand a bit about um, you know China's um, wholesale mo modernization across its economy and civilian sectors as well as its military. You have to look at Deng Xiaoping's four modernizations and how defense really only got a kick after 1991 with that and space specifically got a lot of civilian facing investments Oh, 1986, if I remember correctly. So yeah, so in many ways, China was a bit late coming to it, but that's because it was still recovering from um, politically turbulent decades with Mao at the helm. Uh, so um, uh, Deng Xiaoping was sort of steadying the ship in, in many ways, really, and space sort of came after pro other priorities were dealt with. And until the 1970s, China was also isolated from the international scientific community to an extent um, the Soviet Union never was in the 1950s and 60s when they were also getting their um, you know first space technologies off the ground. So China was really on its own for the most part in its earliest years in space in the 50s and the 60s. Japan and India, for example, their scientists had real advantages over the Chinese because their scientists could uh, interact with the leading Soviet and um, Western sciences on space from the start, whereas China couldn't. Mm. So I, I, I want to pick up on something there because, and I, I'm going to take a tangential story through civilian space and science back to the military side. Um, of course, you know, as you said, um, China is advancing on many fronts, and in particular in civilian or, or basic science. And ESA is collaborating with China on a small um, mission designed to look at the Earth's magnetosphere, a mission called SMILE. Um, and, you know, so and that is not possible at the moment with the United States and China, of course, because of all sorts of issues politically. That kind of scientific exchange isn't on the table. We can do that at the moment in Europe. And we're also some of our astronauts have been training with Chinese, uh, so there may actually be um, shared human spaceflight endeavors in, in the future as well. But if I step backwards through that, I mean, it was, it was just sort of doing a little bit of reading earlier on on, on something uh, in, in a little bit in my past, but much more in Jonathan's. Um, if you go back to one of the, uh, if that's a plasma mission, SMILE, if you go back to one of the very earliest plasma mission uh, missions, there was a thing called ISEE, -E, IC, uh, one, two, and three, three missions. That was a collaboration between what would, became ESA. It wasn't ESA at the time. It was ESRO and then became ESA. Um, and they were three satellites, indeed, also designed to look at uh, the Earth's magnetosphere and the Sun-Earth connection. But on board one of those, on ISA, I, ISE-3, um, there was a, a small um, high-energy experiment from Berkeley, which was designed to look at cosmic 
um, outbursts in X-ray and in gamma rays. And that takes me back, of course, to Vela, uh, the Vela satellites, which were designed originally to look for nuclear explosions uh, taking place test before the test ban treaty was signed and things went underground. Um, that they were a, they saw the first gamma ray bursts. Um, they they detected those, and so this whole history of space science, even of cosmic ray uh, events and the gamma ray bursts in particular, being seen as predicted. Well, well I, didn't, I didn't even know this until earlier on today. I knew that Sterling Colgate was very involved, and Sterling Colgate uh, was an astrophysicist who was also involved in the Castle Bravo test, the, the huge thermonuclear explosion uh, in the Pacific. Uh, Edward Teller apparently was a co-author on the paper that he wrote about de detecting gamma ray bursts in space. Um, so, uh, Jonathan, you're a, an X-ray um, uh, astronomer by training, beyond the and, and by practice beyond the, uh, the the space warfare side. So, how do you see? Maybe there's some other examples you can tease out between you know space science, that kind of you know the pure blue sky stuff, and the military aspect or the the the, the darker side of technology. Let's say. Yeah, I, and there's been a, a close link all along. Uh, a lot of the early X-ray astronomers were uh, present at the uh, Starfish nuclear test in the Pacific, uh, first uh, atom bomb high up in space, uh, and they moved to uh, scientific X-ray astronomy uh, with funding from the military to retain the technology to have X-ray detectors, so that because the X-ray detectors were originally built to uh, find how bright was that nuke. <laughs> and so just in case people break the treaty and we have to go back to atmospheric testing, we want to keep the technology alive. And so we're going to fund you to measure the brightnesses of nuclear explosions on in distant stars. Uh, and, and so definitely there was uh, a lot of uh, connection at that level. Uh, and there's been other uh, accidental collect connections. Not only did the Vela's uh, unexpectedly, somewhat unexpectedly, discover uh, uh, the gamma ray bursts. Um, uh, sort of the other way around, a scientific satellite, uh, um, I think it was Solar Max, had a gamma ray detector that was looking for gamma ray bursts and things like that. And this is in the early 1980s, and accidentally discovered the Soviet Navy's nuclear reactor satellites which were leaving trails of positrons in their wake and the, uh, the SMM would fly through these and see all kind of, you know, think they discovered something and they had to be stopped from publishing the paper uh, when someone took them aside and go, no, actually, we know what these are. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so there is a little bit of back and forth there. And that partly comes to, you know, one of my general hobby horses, which is it's very hard to hide what you're doing in space. Uh, everyone can see what you're up to. And so uh, it's true in x-rays, but it's also true in optical, um, you know, that we can follow along with, uh, uh, you know, optical telescopes looking for astronomical objects can accidentally find uh, naughty satellites. Right. And, and so, so that's, uh, but there's also continuing collaboration with um, uh, scientific research funded. Uh, another example is the Navy, the Naval Research Laboratory has done a lot of military adjacent scientific funding, including the development recently of X-ray navigation uh, using X-ray pulsars as mm -hmm. another form of, of, of navigation satellite. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, the, the, um, the, the clean separation that one might want to imagine exists between the civilian NASA and uh, the various, the DOD and aerospace programs, the, the various military space programs, certainly in the United States, does not exist uh, uh, to the degree that it does. Uh, and even on the European side, right, it, uh, in the national space programs, mm -hmm. uh, CNES, the French space agency, um, is uh, very much involved with the orbital support of the French military's uh, communications and intelligence satellites. Right. Um, uh, although, as we were saying offline, ESA uh, uh, keeps its slate clean. Yeah. I mean, I just wanted to pick up on that as well. I mean, one personal example for me was that it, when I was a PhD student in the beginning of the 80s, 
Um, we were working on the first infrared detectors for, for ground-based astronomy. And a lot of those, of course, have military heritage in order to look at uh, in the Star Wars program, you know, there's not, not what's behind me, but that kind of idea of, you know, using space as a way of tracing ballistic missiles, not only in the boost phase, perhaps in the terminal phase when the rockets have turned off, but they're hot. Uh, you can see them in the infrared. And we we got detectors out of that program into the UK, which was a bit surprising considering they were highly classified. And the first um, multiplexer that we got, not the infrared sensitive part, but the actual readout chip underneath, when we looked at it under a microscope, actually had the word tank breaker written on the side of it. It came straight out of the uh, target on wire, you know, um, uh, yeah. uh, blowing up a tank with a, uh, a rocket on the ground. Now, it's, what I wanted to pick up on that is because that was, of course, the 1980s. A lot of people in the UK and throughout Europe who were very opposed to the Star Wars program and the idea of um, sort of creating another another way of preemptively stopping um, the other side winning in a nuclear war. Right. The idea was that you know rather than mutually assured deterrence, uh, mutually assured destruction, that we could get ahead in that case. Um, and the same was true of the Pershing missiles being placed in, in, in Germany and the cruise missiles in the UK. And actually quite a few astronomers at that point in our area said, we will not use these infrared cameras because we don't want to see, be seen to be supporting the military side. So is that something which you have seen in the X-ray side? You say, you know, a bunch of X-ray astronomers turned up at a, an atomic bomb test, which is kind of cool, but uh, sort of. Um, have you seen any effects like that where people say, no, I'm not going near this because of that link? Uh, in the X-ray, not so much, because I think at this stage, um, it's not seen as uh, as a current issue, right, right. Uh, compared to the early 1960s. But for the X-ray detectors, not really contributing um, to the military mission, even if occasionally um, people m manage to convince DOD to get funding. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, um, I, I do think that the, wa the work cases, uh, I do remember the case where uh, that the Strategic Defense Initiative came to the astronomy community uh, with their, uh, I don't know if you remember, Zenith Star. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was a particle beam. And so the idea was, well, we have this four meter space telescope that we'll give to you to use for receive mode if we can use it in transmit mode <laughs> for a year if you if you support us in, in Congress. And, and the astronomy community basically said, no, we don't think so. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Al although here we are now, right, where the, the, the telescopes or the, the, the optical assemblies for W first, the Nancy Roman Space Telescope now, are excess hardware out of NRO, right? That's right. I mean, that's a little cleaner in the stuff that NRO is throwing away yeah. more than a supporting NRO uh, in, a, yeah. in a collaborative way. So, um, but but you're right. It's it's all you have to be a bit careful. Uh, it, it, it can there's there's a slippery slope that is very easy to go down, uh, and so the scientific community is is sort of somewhat cautious, but maybe not always. Uh, and and so yeah, there's always there's always that opportunity to um, uh, or temptation to take military funding to to uh, um, uh, to say well you know it's actually not ever going to get used so why not uh and uh and yeah i don't uh people have different different views on that um i think it's less the case now than it was 20 years ago though yeah. at the height of star wars so um while we're on the subject you know uh, uh i feel it's a good moment to bring in some of our audience you know who's been uh, watching and some interesting comments being made but also some important questions as well um charles simpson asks uh, apart from india china the us and russia are any other nations or planning or looking at doing anti-satellite attack tests? Um, what, what is the wider field of this? I mean, just like, what is, what is the prevalence of what we're talking about today? Um, so far as we know, uh, or I know, I should say, um, uh, there's, there's no other country really with a sort of as uh, ambitious uh, plan as those countries listed with kinetic anti-satellite weapon systems. Uh, I think no, I think that was pretty comprehensive. Um, Japan sort of, you could say, has a latent capability because it has some of the American Aegis-equipped destroyers, which uh, America used to shoot down um, a satellite in 2008 in what it's called an environmental um, a measure to stop the toxic fuels from surviving re-entry. Um, 
which was also um, a year after the Chinese anti-satellite uh, kinetic test in 2007. Um, so, you know, Japan can be a bit of a grey area, but they're not sort of optimised for it and they haven't had a test and I'm not, I'm not seeing anything suggesting they want to do that. Um, but when, when you get to the uh, lasers or sort of soft kill methods, then it gets a bit more of a grey area. Uh, France made some interesting statements earlier this year about wanting more active defences of satellites. And I think there might have been some muddled communications with some ministers maybe speaking ahead of turn, maybe not quite understanding uh, what exactly they were saying about uh, some weaponized platforms. But um, uh Lasers are, are more accessible. They're still challenging, but I mean, you, they're more accessible to smaller powers or those with less money um, or will to do so. Um, jamming, electronic warfare, um, you can expect that anyone who really wants to do that will be investing in the methods to do it. And those jamming methods are pretty accessible. Um, it's a matter of skill and knowing your targets, vulnerabilities, your specific targets, communications, vulnerabilities. Um, Indonesia has a history of jamming some satellites back in the mid-90s and in a dispute over a satellite slot in the geostationary um, slot. Uh, Iran has no, been known to jam various communications satellites to um, harass broadcast as does want. So um, those sorts of anti satellite capabilities, I mean, they're not the same as hard kill as blowing up a satellite but those soft kill capabilities much more proliferated and uh, but also harder to, de to detect as well and track properly um, but of course the people at um, CSIS and Secure World Foundation produce annual reports on that which uh, which shows the best sort of open source intelligence on that that's available um, but, um, but yeah it's still a fairly exclusive club when it comes to kinetics but it's the americans that still have the best targeting system you know the most comprehensive space surveillance network you know you need to acquire your target before you shoot something at it so you need to know where something is for uh, china russia and especially india um I'm, I'm i don't think their space surveillance capabilities is anywhere near as good as it needs to be to have a very effective um sort of kinetic and satellite capability that can maybe shoot on demand and with enough of them as well mm. yeah i think you know the uh, i mean when you think about when you're asking looking for candidates right you always ask the you, you, who are the space powers right they're the big four America, Russia, Europe, and China, and then the next two, which are India and Japan, and everyone else is sort of, you know, behind. Define Europe. <laughs> well, that's at Western Europe, I would say. Well, define and, Western Europe. <laughs> but because because even with Brexit, space. even with Brexit, the aerospace industry in in uh, Western Europe uh, 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 is uh, is pretty strongly integrated. Uh, and that's less so, of course, on the military side. Um, but uh, but yes, I would I would say the ESA countries and some of the non ESA countries, um, uh, uh, sort of ESA and EU and a few other hangers on is my definition. Uh, yeah, this when it comes to treating you know European space power, I mean, who is who who are we talking about here? Because when it comes to various kind of kinds of infrastructure, it's the European Union because of Galileo and Copernicus, uh, for example. You know those are EU assets. If you're talking about a lot of the in industry, commerce, and uh, science, you know ESA is really important. If you're talking about sort of more direct military uh, platforms and capabilities, you're looking at individual European states, sort of the more That's Western right. European states. So, so I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong. It's just that when it comes to sort of defining Europe as a space power. I'm in a I'm in a conceptual quagmire, especially as an international relations scholar, because I just see all these levels of capabilities in these different sectors. Um, well, I love giving the questions the to United my students. <laughs> you know, in the sense that you know you have you have DoD and NRO and NASA and and you know different competing. Well, but they're all part of the same state, though. So yeah, that that makes it mildly easier to deal with the bureaucracy. But. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, but yeah, no, that's, you're right. I, and there are, I see, for example, um, uh, uh, French Italian military community uh, uh, collaborations in space. And, you know, so there are, uh, there tend, there tends to be a little bit of fungibility yeah. there that you don't see between unrelated uh, states elsewhere in the world. Um, uh, and so the, the point I was going to make is that I don't think any of the European states. Ha have evinced a particular interest in space weapons, maybe a little bit in jamming, 
but but I don't see any serious intent uh, uh, or rhetoric about space control and uh, asserting power over other people's assets in the way that uh, the U.S. and even India have have done. Um, what you might wonder, right, it just occurs to me talking about this, is the other great power is the commercial side of things now in space. So might you see, you know, one company uh, uh, using violence against another company's satellites um, uh, in this era where, you know, uh, regulatory oversight of companies is eroding. Uh, so well, they might... still live within a state with a military that can, you know, take care of people that are doing things that the state doesn't want them to do. It depends yeah, if those how... two companies come from the same state, right? Yeah. Uh, it I also mean, depends how many the power of the state. Yeah. I mean, are you going to let corporations overrule the power of the state? I mean, that's that's a, that's a big deal. I don't want to, but it seems to be what's happening. So, so let me. Okay, I mean, I wanted to pick up on something there, just not not to move away completely at all from this topic. But um, we were talking there briefly about anti-satellite weapons, kinetic kill weapons, uh, which blow things up and, of course, create not only get rid of a satellite, but they create huge clouds of debris. Um, and Jonathan, you you know, you've been following this very closely, of course, for a long time. Um, that you have clouds of debris. This whole idea, for example, with the um, Indian uh, anti-satellite weapon test, that everything would come down. It's like, well, now if you hit it from underneath, a lot of stuff goes up and a lot of stuff comes down, and it spreads in a big cloud, and there's loads of junk for a long time, and it's dangerous stuff. So I just sort of wanted to change the topic a little bit to talk about space debris. Um, and, and that does, of course, impact on the commercial side, even without any military intent whatsoever. There's just lots of stuff being put up there. Not only do we have the uh, Chinese launch, but we had another 60 Starlink satellites go up. I know from, from that you've been following them and a couple of, of the initial prototypes have come down in the last 24 hours as well. So they're in low Earth orbit. They do clean out on some time scale. But the number of objects which we're putting into low Earth orbit now, purely commercially, albeit with a military aspect because Starlink is very interesting to DOD, of course, and, and there's a relationship there now. So how do you see that? You know, that's a, a, a completely different topic perhaps, but give us a bit of insight into where we're going in that regard uh, in the next few years. Right, I mean, I, I think the thing to understand is that um, I, I, I've recently become much clearer about the difference between very low Earth orbit and not so low Earth orbit. Right. And so this area below 600 kilometers where things will re-enter on their own on the time scale of a couple decades versus the higher part of Leo where things are going to stay up for centuries and you really don't want to have, have debris there. Um, and what we've seen is in this very low Earth orbit, a dramatic change over the past year and a half uh, in the orbital population with the launch of these 700 Starlink satellites uh, so far and and that uh, Prior to Starlink, there were only about 400 objects total, satellites and debris, of any big size uh, in that orbital regime. So the environment's already completely changed, and they're talking about not 700, but several thousand to maybe 30,000. Uh, and, and so uh, um, we're seeing a much more challenging environment in this lower Earth orbit, which is where the space station flies. Uh, and so you really don't want to have a bad debris environment there. Um, and, and you're right, the thing, the, the, you know, when the Indians did their anti-satellite test, and there's still several pieces of debris up more than a, a year and a half later, um, uh, you, you will generate debris however low uh, you do it. And it's not just a question of coming from below, right? It's that if you hit horizontally and give additional velocity, the apogee goes up. Uh, and and so there's going to be stuff with high apogees, and so so um, we we keep trying to improve to do things to improve the debris environment. We go let's retire satellites at the end of their missions. Let's uh, let's boost the geo satellites up into the graveyard at the end of their missions. Let's not eject lens caps, put them on hinges instead. Th things like that to to just be tidier. Uh, and yet it only takes one or two major collision events uh, to uh, significantly increase, uh, there was, I guess, the, uh, the Chinese ASAT test and the uh, Iridium Cosmos collision between them were two events that increased the total track debris population by about, I think, 30% or something like that, 20, 30%. It was really significant. So, so you can't afford a lot of mistakes. 
Um, and and uh, so I think the, uh, the understanding is there that we have to do something about this. Uh, uh, and we have to do it soon because, so the other thing you're right is that if we're seeing a big increase in the number of satellites over the next 10 years, uh, most sources of debris are linear with the number of satellites. You have twice as many satellites, you make twice as much junk. But collisions go like the square of the number of satellites. So if you have twice as many satellites, you have four times as many collisions. And so, so at the moment, collisions aren't dominating the debris generation rate, but they soon will be. Uh, and that's when you get into the, this really bad situation. So if we, if we bring that over to you, Blevin, because of course there is another, they, we, we mentioned Starlink and I, I didn't really mean to do that per se. I mean, there are lots of them up there, but there are lots more coming. So Amazon um, uh, Project Kuiper now has uh, licensing for many thousands. And of course the other one is OneWeb, um, which was uh, bankrupt earlier in the year and was bought partly by the British government, but by a consortium to sort of serve a range of nebulous purposes, which might be sort of a partial Galileo replacement, might be, there was this whole idea at some point, we're we actually going to put the Galileo or the, the navigation stuff on some of the satellites, but nobody will know which one it is, so they can't take out our constellation because all the rest will be doing something else. So there's an awful lot being said about that, and I know that, you know, you have quite, you know, not opinions, we have a view on this because, uh, you know, it, it is an important topic within the realm of politics. It's not a purely commercial thing. There's a government side to this as well. Uh, yeah, so, so on, the, on the mega constellations, um, so um, the most sort of recent statements on this, and I, I think I, um, if I remember correctly, Alok Sharma, the biz, one of the business ministers, or is he the business secretary? Um, I'm, I apologise, I can't quite remember his position right now, but Alok Sharma said um, uh, he downplayed the PNT element of the OneWeb purchase. Um, so um, Sorry, acronym soup, PNT. Uh, sorry, uh, position navigation and timing. So he was right. downplaying the sat-nav element of the of the reasons for the OneWeb purchase. So the based on those comments, it seems that the yeah. UK yeah. government it seems the UK government is more interested in the communication services rather than the satellite navigation um, sort of piggybacking option. Um, so, um, so, so that's sort of been the last sort of update I've heard from from the UK government on their rationale for this purchase. Of course, um, OneWeb will be competing with Project Kuiper and uh, Starlink. Um, so we'll see what happens um, uh, there um, and. Yeah, the British government has a stake in and out of the tune of about four hundred million pounds, right. um, and most analysts say that the company OneWeb will probably need another cash infusion to complete its initial sort of operational constellation as well right. uh, over the next few years. So um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what the British government gets out of it. How do you? Sorry, just one last thing there, Alex. Before you jump back in, how do you see though this issue, which of course Jonathan and I have been talking to many people about and are actively engaged in? It's a business of light pollution as well, not just the debris, not just you know, uh, sort of this whole idea of populating the the, the public commons, which has a um, an impact on many players and and it does on optical astronomers. And so with the commercial players, there's one thing, but now a government which pays for optical astronomy uh, as part of its um, you know role around the world, partly with the European Southern Observatory, of course, mostly now, um, the British government is also potentially actively polluting the night sky by having a whole bunch of satellites up there at fairly high orbits, which will be visible most of the night long, unlike the very low Earth orbit ones, which which may actually there may be mitigations for just by the time of time of night. How do you if you is there any sort of engagement there? I mean, I know the Royal Astronomical Society has sort of started talking to the British government about this. Um, how do you see that from your perspective on the legal side? I mean, is that is that something which they're going to care about at all or are they just going to say, well, look, bigger fish to fry? <laughs> That's an answer right there. <laughs> for a good question. Well, you know, the environmental issues is when I see being brought up on Twitter a lot, and um, I mean it's sort of par for the course in many areas of legislation. Really, that um, you know, environmental concerns um, sort of don't always get the top billing that they might might deserve. Really, so um, you know, whether it's debris or sharing, you know, the night sky, being able to see it uh, properly. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't seen any official statements from the UK government on that front. Um, and I know some people are asking for it. So again, um, the UK government is pretty busy right now, I think it's fair to say, with quite a few <laughs> important things, uh, especially something big is meant to happen at the end of this calendar year, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, 
So I, I mean, you know, there's still time, you know, for the for when we have to complete its constellation. But you know, you don't want to leave it too late either. But uh, the UK already has quite a busy legal schedule in terms of legislating for launch services from UK soil as well. So, um, and, and there have been complaints that that process has been slow too. And as far as I understand that, that's been a pretty straightforward legal exercise, really. Um, so environmental regulations of mega constellations, I don't know. That's a complication, but also the fact that one web also has to play by the FCC's rules as well um, and whether it can still operate just based on sort of the FCC and American laws um, uh, regardless of what the British um, space laws might say as well so you have that tension between different domestic space law regimes as well but it's still early days in terms of British investment in this so we'll, we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. Yeah. And I think they really have to decide what it is they they want to do with this constellation because that's you know if they just at one point it looked like maybe they just wanted to do the Galileo replacement in which case maybe they don't need 48,000 satellites <laughs> and and then maybe astronomers don't care right um, but uh, but if they do want to get into this mega constellation internet game uh, that does require the large number of satellites uh, then we have an issue. And I do think, I am mean, encouraged by the fact that the US astronomical community is, you know, it's been sort of slow to get the machine in motion, but I think it is moving now with the recent report to the National Science Foundation and working for a follow-up uh, conference. So we had a conference that talked about the technical impacts of these mega constellations. And now there's going to be a conference that more involves the policy people. Mm. Uh, and, and so, uh, 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 and there's, you know, the, the discussion with the IAU, with the, uh, uh, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, so the UN, is happening now that it wasn't before. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and so uh, I'm mildly optimistic that there will be some accommodation, some influence brought to bear to you know not not stop these mega constellations but to bound them in some way to to regulate them in some way it'll be uh, interesting to see if um, the mega constellations and this you know or rather within the discussion on debris where the mega constellations will feature prominently in any of the outputs that will come from the uk's new drive at the un on trying to assess um, sort of any shared view of what the major risks or uh, threats to space operations are um, t uh, today. So that was launched last yeah. week. So uh, so we'll, so it'll be interesting to see how debris and the problems of it are worded and featured in in the resolution as the UK presents it first. I, I don't think that's been released yet, but also how that survives the UN General Assembly process as well. So, right. so I mean, they're not proposing solutions, so it won't resolve anything, but it might get some common statement of identifying problems maybe and you know that's better than not trying to do anything um, yeah. or nothing so um so we'll again see what what good comes of that sort of uk-led initiative right. um and hope it doesn't suffer the same fate as the eu code of conduct <clears throat> right. yeah i mean i think the key th thing just before we move on the, the key difference of course is that you can to zero authority you can just ignore the astronomers you could just say we don't care um, but the debris issue, of course, affects your own constellation, right? So yeah. if, if you're willing to go up there and you kill your own satellites with your own, uh, it's not just killing somebody else's. So I think that that's a, that's a you know, pressing issue in a very general sense, of course, about how to keep the environment clean for, for, for your own stuff. So it's in the self-interest of anybody that's operating a mega constellation, you would think, uh, to figure it out properly and, and not just, you know, cross your fingers and hope it's all going to work out. I think the danger, though, is overconfidence that the, the problem is, as you, you Mark, as an astronomer, will, will appreciate the uh, non-Gaussian error tales, uh, which means that, um, yes, if you do the math and you say, oh, well, we've got this many satellites, and, you know, probably they, you know, they're, 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 they'll mostly be fine. But it's that rare non-statistical uh, um, uh, screw up that combines with another non-statistical screw up <laughs> that that will get you. And so I think that it's entirely possible that um, there will be a, you know, a big simulation that says that we'll be fine. And then when you actually go and deploy the satellites, you get a bad surprise. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, uh, and, and Starlink keep making these calculations, then and others who are equally expert in the, or, or maybe more so say, eh, you've got your assumptions wrong. So, you know, it's a bit like the epidemiology, you know, physicist wading in on epidemiology at the moment saying, I know how to fix coronavirus, those blinking epidemiologists. No, sorry, you really don't. Just don't do that, please. Yeah, and, yeah. It's, and, it's and, exactly sorry. that. It's exactly that. And unfortunately, um, I think, you know, the biggest hurdles to, you know, the debris issue and also the, you know, sharing the night sky for astronomy purposes, they are political hurdles. Those are the real sort of challenges. It's the political will to actually resolve these issues. And if we're talking about environmental issues, I mean, hoping for the best and fingers crossed is our current approach to climate change collectively as a species, oh, you know, yeah. global warming. I mean, it's not very encouraging if we can't even manage our own climate here. Um, are we really going to sort out some machines and ruining a few orbits? I mean, it's not encouraging, you know, because uh, it's the same sort of, yeah. there's an environmental problem. It's not really a massive problem right now, but it might be for the next two or three generations. So we'll just kick it down, kick the can down the road, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, well, I think just like many environmental problems, until they become a political or financial liability, it doesn't invite immediate legislation. That's the problem, you yeah. know, because as you say, we do defer these uh, solutions until they're simply unavoidable. But it does feel like perhaps we're uh, within a whisper of reaching this unfortunate critical mass because at the moment we're just beginning to flirt with disaster. But, you know, as you say, two or three generations from now, we will have a legacy, I suppose, of what endless space debris, um, no visible night sky, not just to astronomers, but just to everyday inhabitants of Earth. And, you know, uh, this really ugly worst case scenario where we just, we can no longer see our own night sky uh, because it literally has just become a junkyard for corporations. I mean, is this a sci-fi reality or is this one that you could actually envision? Well, if, if um, more than half the world's population is living in cities, I mean, they've already lost the night sky, really. I mean, it's it's a privilege to now to live in a place where you can see the night sky, you know, with the naked eye, really. No. Well, you know, you can, even if you live in a city, you can go hiking now and again. But yeah, I, 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 I do think that it's a real possibility. I also think that there is a space environmentalism community that's starting to come together. Uh, that has taken a lot of these disparate threats to the space environment and seeing them as uh, as sort of a unified whole um, that the the light pollution issue the debris issue the space weapons issue uh, the um, uh, uh, and uh, planetary protection issues uh, are, are all part of this general question of what are the responsibilities that our current society has toward the space environment. And I think that as that becomes elaborated, um, there may at least be a voice forcing people to look at these issues more closely than, than has been done before, maybe in a more integrated way. Than has been done mm. That's, that's but, my hope. Uh, I can't say that the, its political power will be enough to actually get things done. I mean, you know, the long-term sustainability guidelines that came out, was it last year or, or the year before? I mean, they're a reflection of that. Something yeah, you know, that so there, there is some movement, um, you know, concrete movement. Uh, but yeah, we'll see whether they're adhered to because enforcement or adhering to them. You know, it's, it's nice to have a piece, it's on a piece of paper, but we will see whether the industry responds to it properly. We have seen, you know, I think, I think the story of the IADC, the Interagency Debris Committee, which had these recommendations and yeah, they're not always adhered to, but I think they have had an influence in that these non-binding recommendations that were made about uh, the geo belt, for example, flowed down to actual regulations from the individual space agencies where we go, we don't want to be told what to do, but if you give us a suggestion as to what the right rule would be, <laughs> making it, it best practice. I think. <laughs> and, and, so, uh, I, and so that sort of way forward, I think is, is the most realistic way in this era where um, certain countries in particular really don't like the idea of treaties and, and, yeah. uh, and constraints on their free freedom of action. Mm. So, so, so this brings up a really interesting question. And actually um, one of our viewers, um, Chris Lee um, tonight, uh, actually uh, uh, who I, you know- um, it's I think like, we, we, we all know Chris, yes. Hi, Chris. Okay. Uh, 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 he, he kind of read my mind because, uh, Jonathan, earlier tonight, you used a really interesting word. Now, we've had a lot of acronyms on the program. <laughs> In fact, we should probably have a 
acronym counter um, for future episodes. <laughs> Penny in the box every time we use an acronym. <laughs> but one of the most interesting uh, words that I've heard tonight is we, because you said we need to do something about this. And the question is, who is we? Uh, as Chris asks, who can provide the focus for space environmentalism? Because governments are no hope and astronomical societies have vested interests. So who are those people that are beginning to come together and what are the organizations perhaps that can kind of lead the charge on this advocacy? That's a really good question that I don't have an answer for. I might hope things like the Space Generation Council, if the young, young people involved in space could, uh, uh, could uh, take a role in that. Um, there, there are, um, uh, uh, you know, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't have a good answer. I think the, the, uh, 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 there needs to be new organizations perhaps, but the existing space advocacy organizations need to see space environmentalism and not just let's colonize Mars as, as part of what they should be advocating. Yeah. I mean, I, I think from, you know, my perspective on this is that, you know, I think it's admirable optimism on your part, Jonathan, that, that we can come together and sort of, you know, make movement in the direction where the interests who are anti-environmentalist for, you know, for various different reasons. I mean, and it comes back to the climate change question. We know what to do about climate change, but we won't because there are other interests which are more powerful. You know, the environmental movement has been around for decades uh, in, in, in a very sort of strong vocal way, and many people subscribe to it, the earth environmental movement. But has it actually, it's made progress. You know, DDT went away and birds, birds egg shells didn't thin out anymore. The original Rachel Carson Silent Spring um, thing. And we, 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 we cured the ozone hole. But the, the, the interests and the stakes in fossil fuel gen, uh, usage are too strong for an environmental movement to fight. And I just wonder whether, you know, not to be too cynical, do you think that a space environmental movement will overcome the vested interests that certain governments have in, you know, and it's partly about projection of political power. It's partly about um, you know, fighting off the next superpower by maintaining your preeminence, but it's also about resources. It's all, it, at least it's presented that way. You know, let's go and mine asteroids because we'll get rich out of that. And politicians hear that and say, well, that's, they're our people. Let our people get rich and not their people. So the US introduced a unilateral law changing the, the law on the use of objects in outer space, right? Um, uh, for mining. So, so, you know, I don't want to so did Luxembourg. We, they did indeed. And that's, you know, why those companies all moved there, you know, because there were tax advantages put in place for those, the asteroid mining. I won't mention well, a senior, a senior figure from the European Space Agency joined them a few years ago, but I won't go there. Um, but yeah, so I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. We, we can't give up and not do it. But how do we form a coalition, so to speak, that doesn't just give in and say, well, Mega constellations are inevitable. It's going to happen. Let's carve out our little niche to make sure that we can still see the sky on a Thursday, right? I mean, <laughs> this is a larger question, of course, and we can't do it in one hour. It's, it's, it's about the future of humankind on the planet Earth. And, and often the colonizing of Mars thing is saying, well, we've screwed up the Earth, so let's just go somewhere else. It's like, well, well hold on, what? Um, I mean, I, I actually have to come back to you on that one. I, I, I don't hear that latter thing, except in terms of from people who are, arguing against uh, space settlement. The, the, I, I don't hear the space settlement proponents say it's a way of dealing with the fact that we screwed up Earth. Well, they say it's a lifeboat, at least. It's you know, boat, prov yeah. providing an insurance policy, right? I that, mean, it, which that, is... Uh, all right, that's not quite the same thing, though. No, true, I do true. think it's... Because I, mean, I think often it's in terms of things like, you know, what if an asteroid gets us or something like that, right? That, there is a legitimate yeah. argument there. Um, so yeah, my charming naivete, I think you're implying. <laughs> uh, I mean, I no, you're right. I don't believe we can win. I believe that a movement like that can help us avoid completely losing. And and uh, uh, so, and if that's the best we can do, we should still try and do it. Oh, it's it's a political uh, question and policy studies will give you plenty of examples of how to get civil society interest groups to actually change policy, uh, mostly on a domestic level, but you know, also on the international level as well. I mean, you can look at how human rights became a major sort of diplomatic uh, talking point and, you know, achievements, many would say, by the mid 1970s, um, you know, with the various accords there. Um, so, um, so, you know, it is possible, but it's about getting that convergence of interests um, and 
um, channeling the, the right economic interests into the right places with the correct political pressure at the same time. I mean, what you don't want, of course, is pricing your own country out of the international market for various space services or industry and they just go to somewhere that has relaxed regulations so the larger you know economic powers have to do something significant anything significant around the same time to make sure these big companies uh, have have nowhere to run effectively mm. uh, but you have to have that sort of entrenched institutional political will um you know that can exist apart from civil society but with this sort of thing it might have to you know be nudged by civil society broadly defined mm. uh, as well but um as i said earlier you know yeah the technology you know that that's not really the problem it's it's political will and right. economic interest really and it's about getting those stars to align uh, do, really do you think in that regard you know and I don't, I don't mean to sort of make this eurocentric but since europe at some level has taken the lead on on climate change you know in as much at least that our all of our governments believe that it's real and are trying to do things maybe more slowly than we need to but you know there are other governments in the world who just deny that it exists and so is this somewhere where europe because of its particular stance with respect to the militarization maybe perhaps with respect to environmentalism in general or are we just going to be sitting on the sidelines while the other powers then just go ahead and do what they want uh, I don't think the EU is unique in this regard. I mean, any actor can choose to do that as an issue if they want to. I mean, um, I mean, Europe is not particularly special when it comes to not taking part in the militarization of space. It's very much taking part of it. You know, Europe broadly defined, yeah. <laughs> not getting back into that conversation of who is Europe. Um, but um, uh, so, so that's any country can choose to take this on if they want to. So the UK decided to try and do something not specifically about the environment, but about threats to space operations um, uh, in the first place. So, so I mean, I, I think it, it's just a matter of um, who can get what they want out of this and get some diplomatic prestige as well, um, satisfy domestic political interests. Um, and that's that's a question for the politicians political scientists uh, um, and sociologists anthropologists uh, to deal with right. you know um it's uh it's interesting how things come full circle and um uh, when we began the live stream tonight before we invited you both in uh i was speaking with mark and we were just remarking at how you know this is a topic that uh we hadn't quite broached yet on uplink which you know is what makes this you know a, a, a groundbreaking episode although there are very many recurrent themes and one of them seems to be that um when we go into space we don't leave our problems behind you know and it seems that many of the geopolitical issues that we face down here on earth translate you know pretty neatly into orbit as well you know because in many ways i guess as you said blevin you know the uh the fact is is that many of our economic interests are political ones, they all extend to space as well. You know, it's not uh, it's not a pristine environment by any stretch. That's that's pretty much the basis for my book. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so you know, um, and I quote Karl von Clausewitz, or paraphr paraphrase Karl von Clausewitz, the uh, Prussian military philosopher from the early 19th century, um, by saying, you know, space warfare is the continuation of Terran politics by the means. So uh, we take our terrestrial baggage into space. Uh, we use space for political purposes, um, broadly defined. So space is not a political vacuum. It's it's defined by it. Um, you know, humanity's entry into space was for military purposes and military rationales and military investments. Uh, it was to deliver nuclear weapons and launch spy and reconnaissance satellites to make it better to nuke the other side. And that's why the Soviets and the Americans were so keen on space technology in the fifties, forties, uh, and fifties. So, um, uh, so yeah. I mean, all the issues you see on Earth, you'll see analogies of them playing out in space or or space directly being a consequence of it or playing into um you know wider terrestrial disputes so back to where we started with china really you can't understand china doing stuff in space from just the military element or just the economic element or just the exploration element it's all happening at the same time they're all happening within each other's contexts and um it's like how um another another buzzword i hate or phrase is um space program it, is, it implies that a state or an actor has a single space program or a single agenda for space. They don't. Um, so when Amer when people talk about the American space We're program, having a C program, right? <laughs> well, exactly. And I've, I've tried to make that point in various op-eds and editorials. You know, it's like, this is how silly you sound when you say we need a space <laughs> policy. 
well, we don't have a sea policy, do we? I mean, we have like a maritime strategy for how do we employ our naval forces in a time of war? We have a, an air power doctrine, as you know, sea power doctrine. You might have a marine science program. Um, you know, you can have a space science program that would be like NASA for the Americans. But too often people talk about the Chinese space program. It's like you're talking about a massive range of different activities here, even though most of it is overseen by the the PLA. It doesn't mean everything that happens has military significance or and, and I want to push for on military purposes. I want to push on that, though, because, in fact, you were talking about well, how we went into space for military purposes. But in fact, again, that's the, who's that we, right, is that, yeah, maybe the funding agencies, if that's what you're focusing on, uh, saw, gave the money for military purposes. And there were people, uh, you know, there were many different actors who made space happen. And some of them want to do it for military purposes. And some of them were true space cadets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and some of them had scientific interests. And, and the, 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 there are always multiple motivations among multiple players that all have to come together to, uh, uh, to make things happen. And, it, uh, and I think it's particularly when people uh, analyze the Chinese space program, you're absolutely right, that there's a tendency to say, China did this, mm. and you really have to. And even the PLA did this. You, there's, there's. I bet the PLA is as internally structured a thing as the U.S. defense <laughs> establishment. There are many well, different, you know, players and motivations mm. and so on within. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so to an extent, yes. Uh, you know, I, I would agree. There's always varied interests. Um, so you look in the history of Werner von Braun. Um, you know, he built his best rocket science for the purposes of war. You know, his best engineering advancements came from that through uh, funding from uh, uh, the Nazis for the purposes of building the V2s and the V1s, uh, and then subsequently working for the US Army. Um, but of course, von Braun was also an idealistic dreamer who always dreamt of humans in space as an individual. But one thing that just becomes apparent just reading in a f international space history is that you look at the you know the origins of space technology in the major economies and space powers today they all have their decisive origins and f importantly funding within the nuclear and missile complexes of those countries and the role those technologies play in sort of having sort of an underlying strategic autonomy in essential technologies and in essential capabilities so you have that obviously for the soviets and the americans is about launching nuclear missiles and spy and communication satellites um, to spy on each other um, in europe you have britain starting um, with a, a blue streak and then black arrow um, but they dropped that once they realized we don't need a medium range ballistic missile anymore so we can stop the space launch vehicle program as well because we'll just hitch a ride with the americans and that was the british decision the french meanwhile carried on with rocket developments and with west german and italian cooperation under the larger guise of european autonomy or uh, European Gaulism, uh, if you will, and and that had you know strong sort of military strategic autonomous thingy behind it. India and Japan are the same as well. Japan not as overtly militaristic, but um, the rationale for Japan's solid rocket development was also couched in this is something we should not be totally reliant on the Americans for. We should have. I, I, I agree with everything ourselves. you're saying, and yet I wonder if those space that those space add-ons to the military effort would have happened if there oh, hadn't no. been space oh, no. enthusiasts arguing, oh, we should do space as well, you know. Oh, yeah, it's the add-ons. <laughs> so the space science, those are things that came followed from that. For me, it's the origins is mm. military, the origins, the funding that started funding. it all. I'll, the, I will agree with you on the yeah. fund. So, yeah, so, so it's the funding that made it happen, really. And yeah. all the space science followed from those military investments, those spin-offs, everything came after it. But so let me pick up on that, because I think there is, a, you know, one thing we, we you mentioned right at the very beginning, you know, most people don't care about space. Um, and most people don't know much about space. Um, and, you know, this is kind of a slightly wonkish discussion. Uh, and, I, and I say that to my friends all the time in communications at ESA, you know, is that oh, we've done this, we've reached this number of people, we've, you know, we've got this outreach. It's like, yeah, but you know what? 99% of people just haven't heard of us and they haven't really heard of anything, except, as you said, 
most people have heard about landing on the moon. And in fact, most people believe we actually did, right? I mean, there are a handful that don't, but um, we shouldn't give them any more oxygen. And um, But there's the thing, right? It, it, the national prestige aspect of the Apollo program is the thing that people remember. And it's a thing which outside of you know, the military, I know there was a lot of military stuff going on. The Vietnam War was going on at the same time as Apollo, but it did give the United States something which has lasted, you know, a long, many decades as a prestige. Now I see you're disagreeing, but I don't particularly want to go into that, but I, the more my question oh, let's, was, let's. What, but let's ask this question, going back to China, do you think that they will value that aspect? They have done prestige projects elsewhere in the world, scientific ones in Antarctica, for example, do you foresee that China will, for example, go and put humans on the far side of the moon or go to Mars specifically for that purpose? I mean, I'm not a Soviet or Russian astroculture expert, but from what I have read um, and comparing it to what I sort of have read and maybe intuitively have seen and understand about the Americans is space culture and, and the prestige of space, I think, is much more valued in Russian society today um, than the Americans. Um, and also the Apollo program, whilst people remember it, it also even back then was a subject of derision, you know, and everybody knows, you know, the line, oh, we can put somebody on the moon, but we can't do this. Um, it, it becomes that was nationally, I think internationally, it had an enormous impact, I think. I mean, I, I struggle to measure that really because uh, no, again, I think I it's a space it, cadet like... telling them telling themselves pleasant things to. But well, Jonathan and I grew up. We're probably astronomers because of Apollo. I would suspect <laughs> to, to some extent. And I would say that that quote you just said, right, replaced the earlier quote of "You're asking for the moon," meaning something that can't happen. Moon right. Stick. And the transit. I lived through that transition from oh, the moon's impossible to, oh, if we can get to the moon, why can't we cure cancer? And, and so that's not deriding the moon. That's, 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 uh, that was a change in people's understanding of from you can't do much to anything can be possible. That was oh, how I experienced that. The work. interpretation I, that I have of that is, uh, we spent all this money, I say we again, I mean, you know, reading from the American space history and their interpretations of it is the Americans spent all this money on that boondoggle, um, which was a bit ridiculous. Why couldn't they spend the money on something that actually is important? Yeah, that's, but not, uh, that's not how no, I experienced no, no. it in the 70s and 80s. I no, and I, and I would again yeah. say that I think that there is that legacy um, of of kind of doing you know the, the the plaque we do this for all mankind as it said at that time and and you know the amount of flag waving that went on of course it was there but it it was there was that unifier about and I'm, so that's my point do you think China in its current structure is interested in space spectaculars of that kind to the point where I say we will actually go back to the you know go to the far side for the first time as they've been is, driving the u2 yeah. rover around for the first time because that has value is part of it. It, and i do want to ask Plevin whether he thinks i mean for me for the soviet union yes you're right there's a big internal admiration for space in, in russia now and in the soviet union back then but i think the most important thing for the soviet union at the time was that it established in the minds of potential developing world third world partners that the Soviet Union was a credible technical partner yeah. uh, and uh, 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 where it had not been seen as such prior to Sputnik. And for me, that was really the benefit that the Soviet Union reaped from, from their space program. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And, you know, China's, um, you know, doing the same sort of thing. So the prestige element is, is really, you know, is, is important. You know, w w what effect it'll have on Chinese society as a whole, I don't know. Um, you know, the Chinese state has rolled out um, Space Day. So, you know, there's a celebration of China and space every year now. Um, but, uh, you know, as to the actual tangible results of that on, like, Chinese society, I don't know where it'll compare to Russian remembrance of Soviet greats and also continuing Russian successes with the space yeah. station, for example. But I, I, may, I um, maintain it may, may not only be internal to China, though, much as well, the no, no, Apollo program had a worldwide international sort of at the same time America was, yeah, yeah. you know, meddling everywhere in the world and was a military I mean, superpower. John, we remember right. it for yeah. that good thing, right? 
I mean, Jonathan is right. I mean, there is that international prestige element as well in demonstrating the you know, Chinese capabilities in the same way that when, when India uh, sent its orbiter to Mars, um, it also played up it as a symbol of Indian high-tech capabilities. Okay. So, so yeah, that element is absolutely there. Um, I'd just be cautious about um, making more of it in terms of societal impact. Um, I mean, a lot of people remember America more during the Cold War for, um, you know, overthrowing various countries, um, uh, meddling in the affairs of uh, all sorts of countries in the name of the Cold War, the Soviet Union as well. Uh, so, so I, I, you know, in the grander sort of international yeah, relations yeah. context, I wouldn't want to push that element too far, but that element absolutely does exist. Yeah. So, Alex, you have, uh, yeah. we're rolling up on the hour and a half here, yeah. and I know we did say that we could go on all night, but... Uh... Yeah, no, we, we actually could, and, uh, you know, uh, I mean, if there's... Um, one thing that's true, uh, I don't think we've left any episode of Uplink um, having answered more questions than we've actually created. And I think if there's one thing that we've learned tonight is that there are a lot of contentious issues um, that need to be addressed rather urgently. You know, um, the world is not getting simpler and uh, life in orbit is not either. And so, uh, you know, I've got to say on behalf of everybody who's joined us tonight uh, online, and uh, uh, everyone at Space Rocks as well, Levin and Jonathan, what an incredibly stimulating conversation. I think we're going to have to have you back, speaking for Mark as well, because there's just simply so much to talk about as we live in interesting times. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Um, and Thank you. Yeah, before we go, we uh, if, if you've watched any of the previous episodes, you know we do something terribly geeky just because it's good for the appearance. So we we have this thing in Space Rocks, which is the Space Rocks hand sign. We did we're not we're not going to make you dance, Blevin. We I did I did threaten that, and and you. <laughs> I agree that. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Did did we do we agree that we wouldn't do that? I can't remember. So Jonathan's doing the dancing, but at least we do. So we have the the hand sign, which is space, which is the Vulcan salute, live long and prosper. And I got my thumb out this time as well and rocks for okay. rock music so space rocks oh. if we can do that we'll catch a quick screenshot so this is where it gets tricky for everybody doing the yeah, yeah that one i can't do so well <laughs> there you go <laughs> close enough all right well thank you both very much for coming on it's been great having you here and uh, as as alex said we barely scratched the surface and i think there's a lot more to come so we uh welcome you to the space rocks family and we'll see you again soon hopefully thank you thank very Mark. much thanks, thanks very much so Mr. McCorkin, how are you doing tonight? That was an incredibly stimulating conversation. Got, and, uh, uh, you know, I have you've to got say, back bouncing yeah. Jonathan and oh. uh, there, there we are, we're good, yeah. There we go, uh, yeah, bad at multitasking. So um, I have to say, um, I'm not sure if we uh, solved the world's problems, but I think we definitely <laughs> illustrated them, didn't we? We etched them with acid. We made them obvious to everybody if they didn't know before, yes. And I have to say that the uh, uh, the chat room was uh, uh, just bubbling um, tonight as well, just with so many interesting points, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, it does seem like, uh, well, it's a, it's a bit of a tangle these days. Yeah, but, but one thing is clear is that uh, the utopian future that space and space exploration represents for a lot of people isn't really the reality right now, is it? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think it's, there's a lot, of, you know, we, we say this, you know, we bring, bring the guests back, but there's a lot more here to, to, uh, to bring in. There's, you know, other people who can, a lot, lot to contribute there uh, with respect. And we talked, uh, you know, we had um, Alice Gorman on before, right, talking about space archaeology. How do we actually maintain a history of what we've done before? Um, how do we look at aspects, you know, the word colonization came up a few times, you know, so there's a, there's a lot more um, to develop around this. Um, uh, Blevin sort of said it, and it's a phrase of mine, which I like to, to use, you know, space may be a vacuum, but it doesn't occur in one. Uh, and seeing space as part of a much bigger picture. I mean, he's, you know, and Blevin's right, you know, maybe the, this idea that I have that Apollo is very important, maybe that's a space geek thing. Maybe he's right. Maybe in fact, people don't, don't view that thing as the thing they remember from the 60s and 70s in the United States more broadly in the population. So, yeah, bringing in new voices like this, I think, is really important to us. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more to discuss. I couldn't agree more. Well, it's what we do. So thanks to everyone who's joined us tonight. And, uh, well, we'll see you, uh, well, yeah. uh, next episode of Uplink. It's gonna Hopef be hopefully sooner than the three-week gap we've had this time. So apologies for everybody that. But, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if we can uh, get you one soon, a bit sooner than that. Yeah. Watch this space. Very good. Yeah. See you, man. Thanks, Alex. Bye.